America's immigration crisis begins in faraway places like this. Not at the Texan border, but much further south, at the very bottom of Mexico, where impoverished Central America barters back and forth across the Suchiate River. So here's the scene. On that riverbank is Mexico. On the other side, Guatemala. Behind me, the official crossing point. But here is where all the important stuff happens. Smuggling, cocaine, marijuana, people, and most recently, tens of thousands of children. Ten minutes by rickshaw on the Guatemalan side is the central bus station. All day long, passengers step off buses direct from Guatemala City, El Salvador and Honduras. The migrants carry new backpacks ready for the journey north. Some wear smart clothes provided by their smugglers so they'll fit in in America. And the smugglers, or polleros as they're known, are ever present. They earn thousands of dollars for each migrant they usher to the US. It's very clear what's going on here. These people are surreptitiously being handed on into a network that will take them across the border and attempt to take them all the way to the United States. We see a young girl carrying a Disney backpack talking on the phone. We don't know for sure what's happening, but normal practice is that with each stage of the journey, the family gets an update by phone. She doesn't seem to know either of the men she's with. Neither of them would speak with us. She's handed by one to another who leads her across the street into a waiting room, out of sight. She's being made to sit down in the room over there. Workers at the bus station describe the waiting room as the office of the smugglers. We're advised to leave. But then we spot her again at the crossing. This time, she's on a raft with another young boy, two teenagers, and two different men. Hola, buenas tardes. We call out to them, asking if we can talk to them. There's no reply. Asking where they're going. They turn to hide their faces. They cross to Mexico and are hurried onto rickshaws. We try to ask if she's okay, if everything's all right. But she's given no chance to reply. We don't pursue them any further for fear of endangering her. Elves with whatever comes to hand, cardboard, hats, some of them. I mean, there are hundreds of young men, mainly teenagers, on top of the train, but among them I've seen a good, a good dozen or more very young children. Smugglers spin the story that if you're under 18 and have family in America, you won't be deported. The man riding at the front of the carriage is smuggling three teenagers from Guatemala to the border. He agrees to an interview as long as he can hide his face and tells us he's taken much younger children before. He charges $1,200 each. Eight, five, seven years old. Well, it's a big responsibility. If you don't manage to bring them over safely, you will get killed or end up in jail. The family will kill you for sure. Are all the um, smugglers mafia? Uh -huh. Yes, everyone. You have to have a password, a keyword for you to recognize one another. If you don't have it, you end up dead. To what extent does it all happen with the officials cooperating? So the immigration and the police? They are all working with us. Everyone is sent on it. So they cannot get out of it and neither can we. And so they come, carrying cardboard to sit on, the metal skin of the train grows so hot. They push on toward the border, regardless of the robbers, the night, the risk of failure, or even death. The promise of America pulling them northwards for a future that burns brighter than what they've left behind. MS-13 is actually called La Mara Salvatrucha. It's a transnational Salvadorian gang that started in L.A. They've been in the greater D.C. area since the 90s. Now, there's no one reason for the resurgence, but the task force is taking a hard look at the thousands of kids coming across the U.S.-Mexican border alone. It's a fact that MS-13 sends 
people across the border, hoping they get stopped saying they're minors. The unaccompanied minors who are innocent in all of this are said to be more vulnerable, looking for families looking to belong. Police say they're prime targets for gang recruitment. I think the parents, what they need to see is the way the kids start talking. That's when they know something is not right. I mean, if I can tell you what the gang is do, you just stab, shoot, beat that. You know, one of the things that I hated the most was I saw a few girls getting raped. The ex MS 13 gang member says the things he's done, the things he's ordered people to do, it still haunts him. His tattoos are his constant reminder. And I wanted to peel my damn skin off. That's, I regret it. The target, a storefront, a suspected hub for MS 13. The notorious gang known for this brutal initiation of its members. Once in, gang members savagely beat victims with bats and murder with machetes. Mexican drug cartels hire MS-13 members as their muscle. This is what ATF agents anticipate on the other side of the door. But once inside, agents find something else. Men and women locked in a room in deplorable, unsanitary conditions. There was a locked room where several individuals were located. We believe that they may, be in, may have been victims of human trafficking. Human trafficking, part of this transnational gang connected to El Salvador. Agents say MS-13 routinely preys on undocumented immigrants, sometimes forcing young women into prostitution. Eric Hardin is the ATF special agent in charge in Los Angeles. I find all gangs here to be brutal and savage in one way or another with the human trafficking and how they victimize and um, dominate females. That's all violent and very brutal. Law enforcement took the victims in trying to figure out how they ended up here. An unexpected part of a three-year investigation. The overall raid netted dozens of suspects. ATF agents call it a success. They're called the worst of the worst, the most violent, and so uh, arresting those people, um, it does make the neighborhood safer, at least for a time. In the ongoing battle on Los Angeles Street. After being kidnapped, raped, and held as an 18-year hostage, J.C. Lee Dugard was rescued. But rather than condemning her captor, she shockingly referred to him as a great guy. On the surface, Dugard's behavior seems bizarre but it's typical of a psychological phenomenon known as Stockholm Syndrome. Victims of Stockholm Syndrome develop compassion and loyalty towards their captors. The condition follows psychologically traumatizing situations like hostage situations and kidnappings. In fact, Stockholm Syndrome got its name in 1973 when two thieves accosted a bank in Stockholm, Sweden, taking four bank employees hostage. For six days, the prisoners were held in a bank vault, tied to explosives with nooses around their necks. During a rescue attempt, police were shocked when the captives took offense, siding with the captors. Like the Stockholm victims, People who develop this condition endure situations where they're forced to contemplate the reality of severe injury or death. In order for Stockholm Syndrome to develop, a victim must also perceive that her captors have shown occasional kindnesses. Being permitted to eat, not being punished for a so-called transgression, and even being allowed to live are all considered benevolent to someone with Stockholm Syndrome. People with Stockholm experience symptoms similar to post-traumatic stress disorder patients. They may have flashbacks, nightmares, distrust of others, and the inability to enjoy previously pleasurable activities. No one is sure why this phenomenon occurs, but it has been suggested that a victim believes, perhaps unconsciously, that forming an attachment to her captor maximizes her survival. Oddly, Stockholm Syndrome doesn't resolve in tandem with the end of a hostage situation. In the 1973 bank robbing, the freed hostages remained loyal to their captors, even setting up a fund to cover the criminal's legal fees. 
these symptoms of Stockholm Syndrome are actually something of an anomaly.